So we're really happy to have tonight uh, a, a, a wonderful guest speaker for the program coming from uh, just over the hill, uh, our partner group over there in uh, Peregrine Audubon Society, Maricela de Santa Ana, who uh, is, a, in addition to a fantastic birder, is also an educator, a retired school teacher for many, many years, and uh, has taken on the monitoring and of this mitigation project over in Willits and has uh, really been, uh, I think, exploring and, and uh, teaching about the fantastic uh, benefits of that site. So I am gonna let her talk all about that. I'm just really super happy to have her with us tonight. Maricela is just a, a wonderful person and uh, I'm really happy that she's with us. So Maricela, go ahead and oh. tell us a little bit more about yourself and then get into the Willits by Bypass Project. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I really enjoyed your birding um, information too, because I feel like we don't do that enough at Peregrine. We just want to get right into the program. Um, yes, my name is Maricela de Santa Ana, and um, I work for the Mendocino County Resource Conservation District on the Willits Bypass Mitigation Project, which is way too long to say, let me tell you. But um, it, is, it is a pleasure to do that project. Partly, I think I was hired because I did have my education background and I'm also the project interpreter. So I bring the public out at least once a month, sometimes more than that. I try to bring school groups out. Um, it is a, an amazing area and you'll, I'll, I'll be talking more about that um, in the slideshow. So I'm going to talk about the history of the bypass because I get a lot of questions about that. And it really briefly go through, I have some slides with a lot of data. I'm not gonna say all the data on them, but I do wanna go through the, the history of it. It has kind of a, I'm not gonna say sorted, but it has a little bit of a bad history because there was a lot of stuff going on in Willits at the time. There was a pr protests and all kinds of, things um, about the bypass and I feel like at this point um, we're all pretty happy that we have this um, land preserved. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um. So this the bypass was started in in 2013. It was a pretty massive project. Um, you know, it's 5.9 miles of bypass and um, there was a lot of trucks in Willits. It was a hugely noisy project, but they had, they came into problems right away because of the fact that this area inundates every year. So they had to come up with some ways of avoiding the water. And of course the viaduct was one of the ways that they did that. And it turns out to be a very good thing for wildlife. Um, so the, the construction resulted in impacts and those impacts were to wetlands and other waters like riparian areas. Um, it impacted North Coast semaphore grass, and I'm gonna talk more about that later, and Baker's Meadow form, foam, and it did quite a bit of impact on oak woodland. So that was what the mitigation was about, was those particular impacts. So in order to do that, they had to establish 60.5 acres of wetland to, because of the wetlands that they had destroyed. Then they had to enhance wetlands um, 442 and a half acres, as you can see, which is really great because wetlands, of course, have declined massively in the whole country. And so um, any wetlands enhancement and establishment that we can do is really important. Um, there also riparian preservation was 201 acres and then establish establishment was 53.5 acres. Oak woodland preservation, 230 acres. You can see it's a lot of acres. And in the end, we end up with about 2,000 acres of preserved land. Conservation grazing lands uh, was something that was, um, uh, people, a lot of people worked on this because we already had grazing in the valley. And we have these two endangered plants um, and threatened plants, North Coast semaphore grass and Baker's Metaform are listed in endangered plants. Um, for California, and so the, the grazing is an important part of their um, care and um, enhancement project. So that's a lot of acreage. Um, so in 2008, when this was all happening, all the work was happening, we had lots of committees working on it. Um, Caltrans approached Mendocino County Resource Conservation District 
to become the long-term managers because of the grazing in particular, because they needed an organization that understood about land use with grazing. And it took quite a few years before MCRCD decided to take it on. Um, our, our mission, and I work for the Mendocino County Resource Conservation District, um, and Stephanie Sierra is our, is our um, executive director. Our mission is to conserve, protect, and uh, I think restore wild and working landscapes to enhance the health of our water, soil, and forests in Mendocino County. So for a while, we had to really see how this project was going to fit with our goals and our mission. Um, it, this particular project is the largest uh, wetland mitigation project in the history of Caltrans. They have never taken on the size of a project. Now, I, I've heard that the Eureka project, which is coming up, is going to be bigger than this one. It has a lot of aspects to it because of the two endangered plants um, and the fact that we have Andromedas streams going through the Outlet Creek connecting to Eel River. Um, but we have a very uh, fancy <laughs> statement about what we're going to be doing and what we are doing. We, um, it's pretty, pretty uh, complicated work. Um, so there's four of us, and I'm having a little trouble because my screen is getting partly covered, but at least I know the people I work with so I can say these things. Um, so our project manager is Chris Bartow. He has a lot of grazing experience and business experience, and he's just a wonderful person to work with. All of these guys are incredible to work with, and they all are real skilled. You might recognize Robert Konecki. He was on Spotted Owls for quite a few years on the coast, and he is our project assistant manager, and he does our mapping. So we map all of our um, – well, we map lots of things. We map our invasive plants. We map where the beavers live. We map where the, where the pigs are destroying things. Um, uh, Yes, we do map where the Baker's Meadow Foam is and where the North Coast Semaphore Grass is. Jake Steverfield, I, I actually met Jake Steverfield as a first grade teacher, and then I taught him in high school, and now I'm working with him. And it's very interesting to work with somebody you've known so long. Um, he is an incredible biologist in his own right. Robert's a, bi a biologist also. Jake is in charge of our drones, drone flights, and our wildlife cameras. He does a lot of hard work. He's young and very energetic. He does our fencing and um, our, uh, uh, yeah, planting, lots of things. He's an amazing guy. So we have five agencies that we work with. We work with California Division of Fish and Wildlife, and they hold the endowment that we, um, that Caltrans um, established for us. We also work with U.S. Army Corps. We work, work with North Coast uh, Regional Water Quality Board and NOAA Fisheries. Caltrans is still part of who we're working with because they have to reach their success criteria before they can leave the project. And um, we right now we're working with our biologists and they're wonderful. Um, so we're responsible for lots of things, infrastructure maintenance and repair. We monitor the effects of the grazing. We have a certified grazing manager from Berkeley, uh, Felix Ratcliffe, who comes and works with us, and we follow a very tight monitoring with him. Uh, we do it twice a year. Um, and we want to uh, increase habitat for both of those plants, the Baker's Meadow Foam and the North Coast Semaphore Grass. We collect seed. We do um, tarping of invasive plants and then plant those seeds out, or we try to increase areas where they already are. And then we also do stream assessments. And Jim, uh, Joe Scriven works for the RCD in Ukiah, and he is our fisheries person. Um, so I don't know if all of you realize, but this is what normally happens in Willits in the winter time, is that this is our mitigation land. This is what it looks like. I have kayaked out there many times. Um, it really floods and, um, we, the, I moved here in 1980, and we had at least 10 years of flooding that looked like this. We have had, with the drought, we didn't have the flooding like this, and so I think people thought it was, okay, well, that's, you know, that's not going to happen so much, but the last two years, it's looked just like this, so I, this is, this is what happens, you know, the streams overflow, we have Mill Creek, Up Creek, um, Davis Creek, Broadus Creek, Bechtel Creek, um, Berry Creek, all those creeks 
flood out into the valley from the hills. And this is, this is what happens. And it is a wetlands. It's pretty incredible. And some of you may wonder about those lines of trees. Those are, those are fences and the ash tree seeds land on those fences and they sprout. And so they sprout in those straight lines. Um, let's see if I can... Um, yeah, so our goals, our monitoring and uh, mitigation goals are to improve the structure and the function of the seasonal wetlands. We have really and beautiful, beautiful wetlands out there. And then to maintain and expand the populations of Baker's Meadow from North Coast semaphore grass, and we are doing a pretty good job with those. The invasive plant species, they're hard. We really work hard to try to get them out, but every year we get a new supply from the inundation you know those the flooding comes all the new the seeds come down with them so it's it's a it's a problem we're working with we're also trying to protect cultural resources we have we do have some native american sites out there and we're trying to work with the local tribes to see we've got some of them fenced and we want you know we want to work um, in cooperation with with the tribes and then we also have our grazing tenants we have five leases and that's a whole project in itself. Um, they, have to, they have to have their cows on at a certain point. They have to have their cows off at a certain point. Um, we want them to have a certain number of cows out there. We use hot wire to put them into certain areas though that hasn't really worked as good as it, as it has worked in other places. Um, yeah, we use targeted grazing and we work with the certified uh, range manager, but there are large areas, there's a thousand acres of grazing out there. So cows are part of the picture. Because we have so many cows, we also have 60 water troughs and we really work with cow fish and wildlife to try to have wildlife friendly troughs. Every trough looks like this. It means that birds don't drown in here. Uh, lizards don't drown. Um, rats don't drown. We get wood rats in them. And so Every trough has a, a wildlife escape on it, um, and so we have to keep we have to keep inspecting all this system. Um, we have wells out there that we maintain, so that's some of the work we do. And then, like I said before, the pulling of the weeds. There's a lot of work. <laughs> I always come home to my own property and think, ah, I just don't want to pull any more weeds. But but we try to keep on top of it. We also use machinery in some cases, um, and that can work pretty good. So North Coast semaphore grass is a threatened grass that's only found in Humboldt, Sonoma, and Marin counties. Excuse me, not, not Marin. Humboldt, Sonoma, and Mendocino counties. And um, it's a beautiful perennial grass um, that can get to about five feet tall. Um, we collect the seed and um, then plant it. We collect it in June. We plant it back out in November in areas where we want to increase its population. And we have done a really great job with North Coast semaphore grass. It has been also planted as plugs out there. It's an ongoing project with um, ICF, which is our botanist. They've been watching it pretty carefully. I, I'm not, I have not been a grass person in the past, but I love this grass. It is a beautiful native grass. And the cows come in once the seeds have senesced and we've harvested the seed we want, we let the cows come in and graze it, they can graze it right to the ground, it doesn't seem to mind at all. Um, it likes an understory, it's a, excuse me, it likes a woodland, it, it is the understory of a woodland, and we have a beautiful 200 acre woodland that ha is now full of semaphore grass. It's really worth to come and see, and I do do public walks to go see it, and the thousands of trillium that also bloom there. Baker's Metafoam is, very interesting. We have the largest population of Baker's meadow foam in the world in the Willits Valley. It's it's a plant that needs inundation and um, it's very tricky. Um, we also collect seed and plant it out. Haven't had as much success with it, but maintaining the grazing and keep really paying attention to where it likes to grow has been really helpful for this plant. Um, this is what it looks like. It is not your Douglas's meadow foam, which you see in the ditches. Has, this is a, has a much smaller flower. The leaves are different. People always say, oh, I see that plant all the time. Well, you probably don't see this plant all the time because it has a really specific um, soil hydrology need and not the same as Douglas's meadow foam. Okay, we also 
have been in charge of stream channel maintenance, but a few years ago, let's see, 2014, we began to see lots of beaver activity on the creeks, and we've been working with Cal Fish and Wildlife and um, fisheries in particular about leaving the work that the beavers, the beavers are doing a really good job in the creeks, and rather than take away from what they're doing, we're really watching it and making sure that we don't have any um, obstructions to fish passage, but beaver dams are not obstructions to, to fish passage, and that's what we've learned from watching the beavers. Um, so then there's the wildlife monitoring, and this is an aspect that's not, um, it's not a lot of the, of the uh, proposal did not have wildlife monitoring, but because of Cal Fish and Wildlife and Chris, in particular, he felt like it was really important that this aspect, of course, it helps us to see the biodiversity of the area. And so I was hired to do that. Um, of course, like I said, we all have biology backgrounds, but I get to go out and do surveys of wildlife and um, making sure that we have, um, that biodiversity is increasing and not decreasing um, as we're working along. Tule elk came in in 2016, the first one, it was a female. And as the years have gone by, and with the mitigation project and the fact that it has really uh, been preserved and protected, we now have close to 90 uh, tule elk out there and they add a whole nother aspect to the project. Um, we do um, wildlife friendly fences. Jake um, actually developed this particular kind. It's, um, it's PVC pipe with the wire goes through it. Originally we used corrugated um, piping, but this works a lot better. All of our bottom wires have no, um, no hooks on them. They're not barbed so that the young can get through because in the beginning, the young were not getting over the fences. And because they're such a herding animal, those young were, were actually, we had some loss in the, in the Tule Alps. So we have worked really hard to make sure that you get through. Um, and then we're constantly watching these, these crossings because when cows start learning to get over them, then we have to come up with a different way for the elk to be able to get over. Um, we also, if they're broken, we have to keep maintaining them. Yeah, so we have a pretty nice herd. The tule elk are not aggressive. It's really nice to be out there with them. I'm often out there by myself with you know, 28 bulls and you know, all these other cows, and they really are very wary. They don't like to be near us um, too much unless, unless we're the, the people planting grass, and then they know us, and they come running over to see if maybe they could have some grass that we're planting. They're pretty funny. Um, there's a lot of different wildlife here. People don't realize how many bears. I think one year we got eight different bears on our cameras. We have bear dens out there because of the riparian areas. We have foxes and coyotes and bobcats, lots of bobcat. Um, recently we had a mink, mink show up and I know that it is, a, it is an animal that should be out there because it's perfect habitat for it. Um, Black-tailed deer, yeah, we have a lot of great wildlife. We put out nine um, wildlife cameras in different areas. We're always moving them around, um, trying to um, see what's going on out there. But what you're interested in and what I do every year is that I do a two-week um, bird survey. And it was a survey that was put into the monitoring plan by Point Blue. Um, it's 60 points. And it is, it is uh, throughout the mitigation land, except for that oak woodland, that upland oak woodland called plasma. It does not have points in it, which I still do that site every year because it's got such great birds in it. And I just don't know why it's not included. But anyways, part of the reason why it was done was to see the difference between the grazed areas, the grassland grass areas, the riparian areas and the wetland areas. And it, so it was started in 2015. And um, so this was our eighth year. I think one, I think 2015 though, that data is not being used because it wasn't, um, it didn't get entered very well. I was not a part of that. Um, it just, it was the first year and people were you know, new to it. So as you can see the findings, I can't see it, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> 
let's see, maybe I can uh, get this to go away so I can see these now. Uh, there we go. Okay, yeah. So in 2015, um, in the grasslands, oh, darn it. Hey, Nikki, are you there? <laughs> Let's see if I can get this out of here, because I'm not going to remember those numbers. Let's see if it would have to go away. Nope. All right. Well, anyways, we had eight identified grass sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, um, and in... 2023, we had 15 um, sites. And plasma, which is not included in here, has um, at least two pairs that nest there. So our grasshopper sparrow population is going up. We do have Lawrence's goldfinches pretty regularly. Um, it's interesting because this last year, and I think people found this in a lot of places, our numbers were down from um, 2022 and 20. Uh, 21. But it, anyways, these, these surveys are comparisons between the, the different areas. So in the wetlands, the, the problem with the wetland survey is that some years we literally have to wear waders to be able to get out into some of the areas and other years we don't. And so that I think makes a big difference about how many birds we see. Um, some of the birds out there. We have beautiful wetlands. Um, the riparian areas always have had the most diversity and of course um, the no most number of birds. So this year, these were the initial uh, findings. We have lots of yellow breasted chats, lots of sap suckers, lots of western bluebirds. This year um, we did we had a drop in species, not a drop in number of birds. Um, even though we don't have a lot of black crowned night herons, we always see them in the riparian areas out there. So we have counted to date about 142 species of birds. Um, I think there's probably more out there if we had, I keep trying to get Point Blue to come out and maybe do some mist netting for us or set up a mist netting station, but it's pretty complicated. But I think we have more species. Um, we also have an education part of the program, and that's the part I've already talked to you about. I do, I do lots of walks with people. Um, we have, try to get kids out. We have an interpretive center with a classroom and at the Mendocino County Museum now, and so there, that that room has been really fun for lots of kids to come through and see skulls and you know nests and our videos, and then I get them to come out into the valley afterwards. Um, so here's some of the trillium that we have. Um, this is what it looks like right now in between the rains. It starts, you know, there's still a lot of flooding. This, I counted 14 Sora rail here one day calling. It was just filled with Soras. I don't know why it hasn't been like that since then. Um, we do have breeding kingfishers, green herons, um, we get lots of different <laughs> juvenile bald eagles through. This would look pretty scraggy. Um, and then many, many species of ducks that come through. And right now, this is what it looks like out there. We've got white-fronted geese and um, a mixture. I think I saw 14 pintails and about 200 American widgeon um, and Eurasian widgeon, um, green, green wing teal doing their their whole breeding thing, which is so interesting. Um, wood, wood ducks, quite a few wood ducks out there. So yeah, it looks like this. It is flooded. Um, it's just beautiful. Beautiful out there. It is part of the Pacific Flyway. Um, this is Outlet Creek. This is where the beavers live. They live on, on Outlet Creek. Um, this is plasma. This is the woodland. And um, this is our upland site. It fills with um, fills with trillium. We have lots of native plants. We put up uh, kestrel boxes. I just noticed that one of them looks like it's occupied. I'm very excited. It's our first year. We've had them up for three years. The first year I've really seen kestrels 
um, using them. We have ciliated out there, um, lilies. Right now, the tree swallows are in. Um, we have a lot of ash with many cavities in them, so we have a good population of swallows. But something that has really increased our swallow population has been the viaduct because the rough wing swallows and um, purple martins have moved in, cliff swallows, white throated swifts. They all really like the holes in the viaduct, and that's where they nest. I like these cavities for so many birds use them, but these uh, tree swallows. This is a young tree swallow from last year. And the valley turns into the sea of purple with purple camas. Um, this is that north end. Um, we have many, many orioles that nest out there. These owls are nesting in the viaduct, in the joints, the flex joints. I see them almost every day when I go by. My three days that I work going, doing my surveys, I go by and these owls are, we put barn owl boxes up so far, they have not used them. They'd rather use the viaduct. And it's a very noisy. I don't understand how they like that, but they do. Our bulls right now are losing their antlers. They're shedding um, their some of them are running around with only one on their head, but they're getting pretty mellow out there, out their antlers. And then um, our beavers have moved farther north. They were pretty far south for a while. It was easy to get to see them. Not them. I, mean, I only have seen them twice, actually, but get to see their work. Um, but they have moved farther up Outlet Creek, and um, they are really incredible creatures. Here's one of their dams. Um, and when, of course, the when it rains, the fish can get right over this. And here's some of the work that they've done. And here's a little video. That is an adult. It's it's actually the female beaver. She has uh, been working that. That's a um, cottonwood tree. And that is a, a first-year juvenile beaver. It's pretty big. And um, they stay for a couple of years to help raise the young. And this guy seems like he just wants to play. And here comes this year's baby. Not this year's, but last year's baby. Born last year. <laughs> but anyway, it's a baby. And they have quite a relationship, the juveniles and the babies. Hopefully you got to hear that little mewing sound. It's very beautiful. Uh-oh, okay, there we go. Um, we also put up wood, wood duck boxes. Um, they've, they've been very successful. Unfortunately, the bears have also decided they really like them. Um, so we have to really watch where we put them. Um, this is a mom. Uh, I'm not gonna show you this film, but I'll show you the next one, oops. So she, she's below this box, and she's calling these guys out of the box, which is what they do. And um, they, this is how they go out of the box. It's pretty amazing. Now, this box is only about nine feet high, but they can, they can jump much higher than that, 25 to 30 feet. I don't know how they do it and not hurt themselves, but they can Sometimes they're a little shy about doing it. We have a couple really successful boxes. This is one of them. Every year we get wood ducks in it. The other six are hit or miss. Is that it? Oh. So we counted 25 out of this box. Um, this is about as the crow flies, maybe a half a mile from Outlet Creek. So these little guys have to make it 
probably feels like 10 miles to them all the way to Outlet Creek before they're actually in water, running water. They have to walk all that way, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, so this is an elk that was hit by a, tr a car and we pulled it onto the project. And, uh, <laughs> Anytime we have a dead animal out there, there's always bald eagles that come in. One of the things I've noticed about this is that eventually the other birds will come back and the ravens will try to pull the tail of the bald eagle. And we did get a video of it, but I couldn't find it. Um, but it's, they're pretty, they are, <laughs> they have a lot of, they're gutsy, those ravens. They will try to pull the tail feathers out of a bald eagle to get it out of there um, so that they can have their, their time. And that is the end of my slideshow. So I have a blog that I write on the, on the website. It happens at least three times a month, sometimes every week. Um, and you can reach it by going to mcrcd.org and then go to project and then you'll see the the uh, blog and it's basically what's happening out there week by week. Um, are there any questions? So we uh, usually have people type questions into chat. So if you have a question, oh, go ahead and put it in the chat. And uh, the only one I have is the one I put in there while you were talking about the wood duck boxes uh, and the bear problem. How, what do you do about that? How do you keep the bears from just wiping them out? Well, you know, it's interesting. So far, we haven't seen them wipe out the boxes when the babies have been in there. It's like they're ti the timing is just right. The bears are busy, but they come in afterwards. And I'm not sure if they, you know, if they smell the egg, the broken eggs or whatever. Um, but they, they tend to break up the boxes in August. Oh, interesting. See, so they they haven't been a problem for the birds themselves, but they're a problem for the boxes. Then we got to put the boxes all back together again. And it's, hmm. you know, it's, I don't know why that is. Sometimes I think, well, is it because bees have moved in and they can smell bees? I don't know. We clean out the boxes in the, in like February to make sure they're all ready to go. And there'll be at least three or four boxes that are torn apart, but we know that they, they weren't torn apart until late, late summer. So Interesting. So they're not actually getting the eggs or the chicks. No, so far not. Now we have some. We had a picture. I think you could see that raccoon trying to reach yeah. in. They can't, they can't get them. Right. Yeah. The boxes are designed to keep them out right. of reach. Right. Yeah. 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 I think the only way you could do it. I mean, if you were really having trouble with bears, you'd have to use electric fence. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then I don't know how the birds would feel about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me see. I see. There's another question up there now. So they could just speak it because there's. Okay. Yeah, probably. We don't have that many people. Sometimes we get a lot of people and it's, it gets to be confusing having too many voices. Are there field trips open to the general public that you announce on your blog? Yes, they're free and they're open to the public. And um, yes, they're wonderful. I, I, I meet such nice people. So you should come. <laughs> Yeah. This year for sure, yeah. Catherine wants question. to know how bad the mosquitoes are. Yes, I don't. Have, we don't have too many mosquitoes out there. Um, let's see who's who is that voice? Friday. Jim. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, because I didn't feel like typing. I guess lazy. The um, <laughs> the South Interchange has all that rock rock work done. Is that part of this project? And no. if so, why? No, the no. south interchange, that happened because there is a lot of water underneath that particular spot. And actually, um, you know, they had to stabilize it. They had to take it apart and redo it because they mm -hmm. had done it in a way that was not working. But that is not part of our project. Our project pretty much starts, um, you know, where the co East Commercial is. That's that's actually a really good spot to see the purple martins nesting in the in the viaduct. By the way, we have a white. There's a ranch house there called the Coleman House, and that's our office. Um, it starts there and it goes all the way to Reynolds Highway, 
and then there's that piece that's on East Commercial that's the plasma piece. Um, I wish I should have a map of it up here, but I do have a map at the Inter Interpretive Center, which I'm there on Wednesdays. It's the Mendocino County Museum, which is free if you have a library card that day. So it's a good day to come. And, and um, you can see a map with all the mitigation lands um, outlined. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I think I think that there's, I mean, we've had Sandhill Crane and um, uh, Dick Sissel and I'm trying to think of some other strange birds that have come through. And I think that birds are always coming through, black and white warbler, but there's just, we don't have somebody out there enough to see them. Right, okay. yeah, just yeah, just having you go there and do those regular surveys, it, it's amazing when you get any place where you do regular surveys, it's remarkable how many birds you turn up that nobody knew. When yes, yes, there. exactly. And I've just gotten a, I, I see this question here, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the surveys. I just got an MOU with the city so that we can do six public um, uh well, it's wastewater treatment plant walks because they had it close to the public. And, you know, Mike Curry was doing this great job of keeping track. And then they told him he couldn't come anymore. And we're like, well, it's really important. We've got American bitterns nesting there. Um, you know, we get yellow-headed blackbirds. We get redheads. I mean, there's that, that sewage treatment plant, which is between two mitigation lands. I mean, between two of the, of the bypass lands. I have to drive through that the wastewater treatment plant sometimes every week. And it's crazy because all I want to do is stop and bird. It's so good. <laughs> uh, but they, they have, uh, they, after many years of me pounding on the door, knocking, there's, they're allowing me to do six trips. So I've done two so far this year. They both have been rainy trips, unfortunately. Still people came. <laughs> you know, pouring rain. Um, yeah, so how long are the surveys uh, Cited, slated to continue for the entire for perpetuity. It's part of the it's part of the mitigation uh, plan. So the way that Blue uh, Point set it up is that they will be done every year. And this is a project is a perpetuity project, which I heard just read is like ninety nine years. That's really unusual. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been involved in mitigation monitoring projects, but I don't remember ever coming across one that was actually planned to go in perpetuity. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, some of the, because the criteria is that we increase diversity, that we, that grazing is done with those plants in mind, all of that has to keep being monitored forever. I mean, uh, that's no, remarkable. That's no going to wind up being an incredible resource. I mean, I think you know, so. a generation from now, there's going to be people looking at 40, 50 years worth of data. Yes. Yes. And eight, not, eight, yeah. years yeah. Enough. eight years is definitely not enough. No. Uh -uh. About the fluctuations that we've had. No, I would love to see it, you know, 50 years from now. Exactly. Um, yeah. And we, we do, I mean, at some point we would love to have, some kind of docent program, you know, a, an interpretive trail with signs, you know, all those kinds of things. But until Caltrans is done with their part, we really can't talk about that because mm -hmm. they're, they need to finish what they're doing, which is they planted two and a half million plants out there, 80,000 oak <laughs> trees, 80,000 oak trees. Wow. It's crazy. It is such a huge project and they watered those trees for five years with water trucks so we have some wow. nice looking uh native revegetation out there they took the riparian areas and they increased them in size right they widened them which is how riparian areas should be right I mean, as they should be three miles wide or even 10 right. miles wide um so they're working on doing that. And some of the areas have come back so beautifully. Um, it's very exciting. I bring, I bring people like people who were very against the bypass out. And I feel like what happens is people see, oh, um, you know, yes, maybe we didn't need the bypass, though there's still people that still think that we did need the bypass. But it is such a benefit to have 
these acre, these acres put aside and 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 studied and restored and you know all those kinds of things it's such a lovely I don't know I feel really good about it <laughs> that's all I can say well it, it's, it's nice to see what we can do in a positive way when we yes. you know when we try <laughs> I mean yes. there we accidentally do so much harm and then it's remarkable in many cases how I mean I wouldn't I don't know that I want to say how easy it is but it's remarkable how successful we can be at restoration when we just put the effort into it. Yeah. yeah. You know, plasma, which is that, that 200 acre piece, there are two oak woodlands in that, in that area. And they were five to six feet high with Himalayan blackberry. Uh -huh. And in the seven years that I've worked there, all that blackberry is gone. I mean, not. I haven't been pulling it out by hand. You know, we've been using all kinds of things to pull it with. But what has happened is, is that now there's a thousand trillium in there, and and leopard lilies, and the and the North Coast semaphore grass is completely taking over the forest. It's so beautiful. So I take I take walks there pretty often in the spring because I want people to see that. <laughs> What can happen? And we can go right up to the fence where the neighboring property is still the same. Mm -hmm. It looks like what the forest looked like before we, you know, we began managing it. And it's, it's pretty fantastic. It's, it is, like you said, very hopeful. All we, all we need to do is put resources towards it. I mean, it, this mitigation project cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, yeah. It was a problem, but but there were a lot of agencies who said, Caltrans, if you're going to put this bypass in, then, you know, these are the things you have to do. And there was a public, there was a group from the Environmental Center who were very involved, too. So they had a say at the table, basically, um, about what needed to happen. And I think all that together made this pretty amazing mitigation. Yeah. yeah. So, well... I hope people will come and see it. <laughs> yeah. I need to come up. When do the grasshopper sparrows show up? Um, probably the first week of May. It might be a really good time because they're singing away and you really uh -huh. get to see them. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, they're on the, they're on the fence posts They're You know, I've, I've been on filters where we've been searching for the grasshopper sparrows. You don't need to do that very much out there. They're, they're very, um, you can see them very easily. Nice. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to have you out, Tim. I'd love to come out. Yeah, well, let's put it, we'll put it on our calendar and make it happen. Okay, that'd be great. And, um, yeah, and I wish I could get out to the coast more. I mean, like I said, there's just always so many beautiful things happening out there. Well, let me tell you a story that happened to me today. I was out in the north end, and at the north end is where the biggest wetlands are, and there's lots of heard a big racket and there was two red shouldered hawks and they were chasing this incredibly beautiful golden eagle and i thought uh, well that, that's not a problem you know these are little tiny red shouldered hawks well that eagle hit hit a wire and it must have it must have gotten shocked because it fell right down on the ground on its back holy so I cow think, do you think it hit both wires and it got a shock from that because it was going through the wire. I don't know, but there it was on the ground, on the road, Reynolds Highway. And I walked over to it. It flipped over and then tried to fly and hit. it got stuck on the fence on the other side. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to stay away from this bird. Somebody else had stopped and they were really concerned. They had this carpet. I said, no, 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 we're not going to touch this bird. We're just going to leave it. And then it, it got up, flew right over our heads and ended up in the cow. Uh, corrals in the corner and I thought and it banged into that and so I thought oh no this is this is it for this bird so I came around the corner of there was a tree there and tried to see I, I tried to see what it was doing and it was it had its talon through the through the fence but its head was on the other side I, I just figured it had broken its neck or something it was just really sad but I stepped on a little twig and made a snapping noise, and it immediately turned around and looked at me and flew out of there <laughs> so fast, uh, and then chased by the two red-shouldered hawks. 
I just, it, I just thought, what the heck? Leave him alone. But anyways, he got, he got away. But it was a quite, a, quite an event. That's all I can say. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the drama that you sometimes yes. get to witness? Yes, and that's, yeah. that's what it felt like. It really yeah. felt. Wow. Yeah. That is wow. remarkable. That's wow. weird, though. I mean, it couldn't have, it couldn't have gotten itself shorted between the wires, or it would have just killed it. Well, that's what I was wondering, but it made a bit, I heard a bang. Oh, really? Wow. I did. And I thought, wow. was that the box that, but then it would have died. It would have been, it would have sure been. Sure seems dead. like it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it did land on its back on the, on the road. Yeah. It must've got a shock, but just not enough to kill it. Maybe. Wow. Yeah. They're amazing. Got lucky. Yeah. He got really lucky. I thought. And then I would, then I was worried when I was flying that the red shoulders were going to. I, I thought for sure that red, that it would just turn around and, you know, do something with those red shoulders. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's punching above your weight, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> they, they look so small. I was like, wow, look at these small little red shoulders. No, it's just with a big eagle. Almost all birds look small next to a golden eagle. That's right, that's right, yeah. Could you, was, it a, was it an adult, could you tell? It. You know what, it was an adult. Um <laughs> But it had, it did have a little white on its underneath, on its wing, just a little tiny patch. So maybe a first year adult. Maybe, maybe a third, yeah. Third year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Third year, but um, I don't know. It seemed like it wasn't. It, it, why would it, I don't? It, it, those were big wires too. I'm surprised, and they're they're always there. And it's this is a pair that lives up on the hillside across from litigation land. We get them on the, on the, um, we have trouble with pigs out there and we do have license to kill the pigs. And so we drag the pigs out and let animals eat them. I and mean, we also give them away sometimes, but, but when we have so many, we do drag them out and we often get a pair of goldens that come down and try to eat those pigs. So it's right there. Yeah. They'll take care of it. Yeah. yeah. Not quite as regularly as the baldies do. <laughs> no, there's always balls. And I swear they'll just come no matter what. There's a yep. ball. Um, yep. Yep. Cool. And red tails do too. We get red tails on them. Yeah. 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 Oh, I oh that's that. great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me um, speak about, I, you know, as you can see, I'm pretty enthusiastic about the project. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> Well, thank you, Maricela. That was really a fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you, Tim. Thanks. And